morning to you all. We're uh, going to try to address a subject for a few weeks. Uh, actually, this morning, and then it won't be for several weeks because uh, I'll be gone two Sundays in January and we have the Lord's Supper. Dr. Murray will take the class next week Sunday. I don't know his topic yet. I told him he could do anything he wanted. So I'm not even sure it'll be related to family living, but he'll take the class next week, Sunday. Dr. Johnson has been, uh, you notice, not with us the last few weeks because of his wife's condition. He's he's listening on uh, sermon audio and things, or or by phone, I think. Um, So we'll we'll play it by ear, and we'll we'll go forward looking at different um, possible uh, teachers to substitute for me when Dr. Johnson can't do it. When I'm, when I'm gone. This morning I'd like to focus particularly on how to teach children to listen in church. And then on a future occasion I want to look at perhaps even a tougher question, how to teach children to listen at home. So turn with me please to Luke 8, Luke 8, verses 11 through 18. Jesus has just told the parable about the sower sowing, and now he interprets it in verse 11 through 18. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit, with patience. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known, and come abroad. Take heed therefore how ye hear. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have thus far. Let's pray. Great God of heaven, we bow before thee in these moments and ask for thy help and guidance as we address a very practical subject, a challenging one for parents, and one so critical for effective functioning of our children in society, in church, and in the home, how to listen. Open our ears, Lord. Teach us as adults how to listen. And teach us to teach our children. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Listening is probably one of the most underrated skills of our society. I would estimate, having spoken with uh, literally tens of thousands of people in my life, I would estimate that less than 10 people, 10% of the people, know how to listen. Most people, as you speak with them, are thinking about what they're going to say next and not really listening. That's true in church. It's true at home. It's true in society. Many people, as you speak with them, could be many of us as well, say very predictable things. We have a nice exchange and we go on our way we haven't really 
listened. And of course, this is the task of professional counselors, to learn to listen. When you're a counselor, as a pastor as well, you read books about how to do it, you read other things, and you get convicted. Various counselors offer different techniques on how to listen. But generally speaking, to listen is to really put yourself in the shoes of the other person. To hear what they are saying. To know where they're coming from. To know where they're going. And so, effective listening is listening that reflects back to the person. What that person is saying in a way that helps him go forward and open up the more. So if you said to me this morning, I really had a difficult time getting to church. I could listen and say, well, yeah, so did I. Have a, have a good worship service. That's not really listening. Or I could say, so you really had some problems getting here. See, I'm reflecting back. And you're going to say, yes, I had difficulty getting out of my driveway and, and, and you know, we, our car banged up against the, uh, the mailbox on the way out or whatever. And, and, and I'm going to say, oh, what, was, was there damage? You know, see, one thing leads to another, and I'll get your whole story out if I effectively listen so that you feel you've unburdened all your difficulties that morning to me. What I'm saying to you is less than 10% of the population knows how to do that. And when you meet a person who really listens and knows how to draw you out in the depths of your being, far beyond external things, like I had a difficult time getting to church this morning, but when you meet someone who really draws out your deepest desires through effective listening, your deepest fears, you know you've met a good listener. There's something about that person that you can say, that person draws me out. He really listens. Now what I'm saying to you, and this is just prefatory comments, is if you want your children to listen to you, you have to be a model listener to them. And you have to model for them, also in the presence of other people, what it means to listen. So that listening becomes for them a skill that is better caught than taught. Yes, we teach our children. But they catch it more than we teach it. And so what is critical is that when children hear us speak with other people, they hear us effective listening to them, and we become role models for our children. And they grow up naturally learning how to listen. Now, why do we have such trouble listening? Why does human nature not want to listen? Well, I suppose there's two reasons. One is we're corrupt and we don't want to hear either what the Lord has to say to us in church, or we don't really want to hear correction from what other people are going to advise us to do. We're self-satisfied. We don't want to change. And the second reason is that we're just basically selfish. We'd rather care more about what we think and we say and we do and have done and are going to do than get interested in anyone else's life. Any pastor will tell you what I'm about to tell you right now, that we who are in the, in the business of listening, may I say it this way, when we go to people's houses and draw out their lives and draw out their children, their family, it's intriguing 
But we will have people say to us at the end of an evening, it's been absolutely great getting to know you or getting to visit with you. When you, when they, you haven't said one thing about yourself the whole night. Because they enjoyed talking about themselves the whole evening, which is fine. And as a minister, you learn to enjoy that as well because you care about people. So that's a fine thing. But it's amazing. I've noticed this over and over again. That when people spend the entire time talking about themselves, they have a wonderful time. But how much more meaningful life becomes when you really invest your life in other people. And so just ask yourself, do I invest myself in other people by listening to them? Am I the kind of person that people come to to share their life with, to open up? Do people naturally reveal things to me because, well, I listen? It's an important question. And so, we do a lot of talking to our children. We do a lot of talking to other people. But let's Remember, if we want our children to be good communicators with other people, not to be selfish, we've got to model listening skills ourselves. So that's the subject that we want to approach in a global way. Now I want to focus, first of all, today and probably one more time on how to listen in church. And then we're going to come back full cycle and talk about listening at home and listening in relationships with other people. John Calvin often talked with his congregation about how to listen in preaching and what to expect of those who preach, how to listen positively, how to listen um, constructively with criticism, And Calvin said, scarcely one in ten hear a sermon. It's very depressing for a minister, in case you didn't know. But if profitable hearing was a problem in Calvin's day, when they had very little modern media bombarding them with all kinds of sound bites and and, and quick reactions... How much more in our day when preachers have to compete with all kinds of media that are savvy and geared to getting the ear and the attention of people? And in fact, with such quick pictures and sound bites that many people will advise ministers today don't ever preach more than 15 minutes because Americans can no longer handle more than a 15-minute message. Well, Calvin was one of the few preachers who kept stressing with his people how to listen. He taught them how to listen. Not just how ministers should preach, how they should listen. You'll find it again and again. It struck me this summer when I was reading his sermons on Deuteronomy. How often he comes back to this theme, teaching his people how to listen. And of course, Calvin's emphasis here was flowing out of his high view of preaching. Because he believed that in preaching, God comes and speaks to people. In fact, Calvin had such a high view of preaching, it's it's scary actually, but what he actually taught was that as long as the minister doesn't contradict the Word, when he contradicts the Word, it's just the minister talking, but when he doesn't contradict the Word, it is God Himself speaking to the congregation as if He were speaking the very Bible, the very Word of God. So that Calvin said to his people, When you come to church, as long as I'm speaking the Word of God and I'm a duly ordained minister, and this is God's duly appointed time to gather in the assembly of the congregation, God Himself 
is speaking to you. How in the world can that be when I'm a mere man? Well, Calvin said, there are really two ministers speaking at every sermon. There's the external minister who is the mere man who is speaking the words, and there's the internal minister who is the Holy Spirit who is taking the words and addressing them to the minds and souls of people. And so preaching, Calvin says, is the organ, the instrument, and the authority that the Spirit uses in His saving work of illuminating, converting, and sealing sinners. Therefore, wherever the gospel is preached to us, it is as if God Himself has come in the midst of us. There is an inward efficacy of the Holy Spirit when He sheds forth His power upon hearers that they may embrace a sermon by faith. Now, the Puritans followed in Calvin's footsteps here. They didn't talk as much about it as Calvin. Perhaps not quite as much. And yet a number of the Puritans addressed this whole subject in some depth. The Puritans took it up even a bit more quaintly. One of them calls the 66 books of the Bible the library of the Holy Spirit. And he says, preaching is God speaking to us through that library as a father reads a book or speaks to his children. You see, God gives us His Word as a word of truth and as a word of power. So it's very critical that our children know that when they come to church, God is speaking them to them through His library and that therefore it has the authority of God Himself and is absolutely critical that we listen to what He has to say. And then the Puritans focus on all kinds of practical directions. Uh, Samuel Annesley has a sermon. How may we give Christ a satisfying account of why we attend upon the ministry of the Word? He talks about listening. David Clarkson has a sermon called Hearing the Word. Thomas Manton, The Life of Faith in Hearing the Word. Thomas Sr., How We Hear the Word with Prophet. Thomas Watson has several pages on listening to the Word. Thomas Boston has three different pieces on it. Thomas Shepard has a sermon on ineffectual hearing of the Word. Now, after the Puritan era, 1700, suddenly, from 1700 until today, you will find no literature, no emphasis, except for a 19th century work by Edward Bickerstaff on hearing the Word on listening to sermons. Why is that? Why so much emphasis by the Reformers and the Puritans, and then so little since then? Could it be, I'm just suggesting, because I don't know for sure, but could it be because there's been a de-emphasis on what preaching itself is? And it's seen more as something that man does rather than something that God says. Well, whatever the case may be, the words of Jesus still hold true. Take heed, therefore, Luke 8, verse 18, how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Because you're going to be, under any sermon, you're going to be one of four kinds of hearers. Either the, the sermon's going to fall into the thorns, or it's going to fall on the rock, or it's going to fall on the hard path, or it's going to fall into your heart and give abiding fruit. So when you talk to your children about sermons, here's the foundation that you must lay about listening in church. You must impress upon them the importance of what is going on in church. God is speaking to them personally. And then you must show them that under every sermon there are different kinds of hearers. And they must be the hearer that receives the Word into their heart over and over and over again. We must stress with our children this very important thing of coming to God's house, prepared to listen, and then listening, and then putting the listening into practice. And so that's the three things I really want to talk to you about under this subject heading. Preparing for listening, 
then listening, then putting listening into practice. Well, how do you prepare for listening? Five things. Number one, you prepare yourself with prayer. So you teach your children that they should pray privately for God's blessing before they come to church. Secondly, you reinforce it with your own prayer at the mealtime, especially just before the church service. I, I think half of your prayer, if not three quarters of it, at that mealtime should be to beseech God that we might hear the Word and receive it and, and live it out, and that God might help the minister to bring it to us, and so on. Let there be an emphasis before every sermon in your family the importance of coming to God's house, so that children realize this is extremely important, that I listen. Puritans used to put it this way, don't only dress your body, but also dress your soul with prayer when you come to God's house. And then thirdly, of course, you teach your children to pray when they come to the sanctuary. We were extremely alarmed to hear in the consistory room, I don't know how true it is, but someone told us, a few people told us actually, that there were some little children that weren't praying with the congregation when the congregation prayed. That's why we had the announcement a week or two ago. And uh, frankly, it stunned me. Uh, I thought certainly every father had taught his family that when the minister and the elders and deacons come out to pray, the whole congregation prays. Even if you're a three-year-old, you fold your hands, you close your eyes, and you pray for a blessing on the sermon. But apparently that wasn't being done by everyone. I hope it is now. But... That's the responsibility of you as parents, to teach your children to pray for a blessing upon the sermon. And when you put a lot of focus here, you see, what are you doing? You're reinforcing in your child's mind, I must listen. This is important. Number two, come with an appetite for the Word. Come with an appetite for the Word. Thomas Watson said, A good appetite promotes good digestion, a good meal, and good growth. Peter put it this way, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. And Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1 says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to offer the sacrifice of fools. So you have to come with a tender and a teachable heart, asking, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? We come to every sermon saying, Lord, this is how we should come, what needs to be changed in me? What needs to be done differently? What do I need to learn today? And you see, when we come with that attitude, our children will pick up those vibes. They will learn to listen better as well. Now, to come with a teachable heart, to come with an appetite for the Word, means that you don't rush around till midnight on Saturday night and fall into bed exhausted, and then get up the very last moment before you come to church and frazzle, quickly gather your children together and hustle them into the van and quickly get to church, and you make it by two minutes and you drop into the bench and you're, oh, you're, you never even thought about the sermon, you never thought about what's coming out. Well, what are you teaching your children? The only important thing is just to get there. What did the Puritans teach their children? Do you know that most of the Puritans spent Saturday evening with their families, home together? Certainly can't make that a rule in our day and age, but... That's what they usually did. They spent the Saturday evening home alone together. They prepared for the Sabbath. They prepared for preaching by reading together, by talking together. If they knew what the minister was going to preach about, often the father would talk a little bit about it ahead of time. 
For example, if you know what next Lord's Day is going to be, translated into today's language, you, you, you open it up with your children. You say, this is what the minister is going to talk about tomorrow. Let's go over this. Let's talk about this. You prepare. Or if the minister is doing a series of sermons, you pretty well know what the next sermon is going to be. One Puritan put it this way. If you bake your bread on Saturday evening, you will find it warm and ready to be eaten on Sunday morning. That's often what they did, you see. They, they put the bread in the oven on Saturday evening. Sunday morning they took it out. It was good for eating. And so they said, warm your heart on Saturday night. Put your heart into the oven, as it were. So then on Sunday morning, you're in the mood, you're in the frame of mind, you, you, you've spent some time Saturday evening preparing, getting ready for worship, you're anticipating the day. By, Saturday, by Sunday morning, you have an appetite to come to the Word of God. And so Sunday morning, you get up sufficiently early so your family can be ready without rushing, without panic. And on the way to church, try to speak about something about what the sermon might be about. Or if the children are talking about all kinds of things. And try to steer it in a way like, this is the Lord's Day. Or maybe they're arguing and bickering on the way to church. Maybe you just need to say, children, we're on the way to the house of God. God is going to be speaking to us. We've got to be in a good frame of listening. We'll talk about these things later, tomorrow, not today. Let's think about what we're about to do. We're going into the house of God. Number three, meditate on the importance of the preached word as you enter the sanctuary of God. The high and holy triune God is about to meet with you, to speak to you directly. The voice is on earth, said Thomas Boston. But the speaker comes from heaven. What an awesome thought. The gospel is not the word of man. It's the word of God. Come to church then, looking to God and not to man. And teach your children that. Let your whole demeanor, as you enter church, as you meditate, perhaps as you read the Bible ahead of church, let it convey that. Blessed are the children, in my mind, who see their mom and dad searching the Scriptures ahead of church, not looking around to see who, all who's here and who doesn't come. And not an air of curiosity, but an attitude of worship. You don't have to read, of course. You can sit and meditate, but let, the, let your children feel that you realize you're coming into the presence of God. And it's good, I think, from time to time to speak to your children about the fact that every single sermon they have to give an account of one day. Everything will have eternal consequences. Every sermon is a matter of death unto death or, or life unto life. The Gospel preached will lift us up to heaven or it will cast us down to hell. It will advance our salvation. Or it will aggravate our condemnation. Coming to a sermon is a very serious business indeed. Thomas Watson said, Woe be to those who go laden with sermons on their shoulders into hell. The nearer, said David Clarkson, to heaven any are lifted up by gospel preaching, the lower will they sink into hell if they heed it not. Take heed, therefore, how you hear, children. This is a serious thing to do, to go to the house of God. Fourthly, remember as you go to the house of God, you're entering a battle arena. Many enemies will be there, children, to keep you from listening. There will be internal enemies in your heart, indwelling sin. 
your own ignorance and blindness and maybe your own evil heart that wants to not listen. But there will also be external enemies. Satan will want to keep you from listening, children. And worldliness, and maybe even your toys, and the things you play with, and the things you do, will try to keep you from listening. Satan will try to get your mind to fix on those things. But whenever you have a thought come into your mind that takes you away from the sermon, children, ask God, ask God, to help you put that thought out of your mind and go back to the sermon. And when your mind wanders again, say, Lord, forgive me, and go back to the sermon. And when it wanders again, say, Lord, forgive me, and go back to the sermon. You see, Satan is always trying to get you, children, to not listen to the sermon. He wants to disturb you before the sermon. He wants to distract you during the sermon. And he wants to dismantle the sermon from your mind when it's done. You see, Satan has activity before, during, and after the sermon. So should you. You should battle him and pray for strength to overcome all enemies by listening well. And fifthly, come with expectation. Come with expectation. There should be, when we come to church Sunday morning, in our prayer at breakfast time in our families, there should be an air of expectation. We get to go to the house of God. I told you already how I wake up all my children on Sunday morning. I say, it's our favorite day. We get to go to the house of God today to worship God. No matter if they're groggy. I want that to be the first words they hear. This is an exciting thing. This is a day of expectation. This is a day that God normally works. There's a Puritan by the name of David Clarkson He has a sermon, I forget the exact words, but it's a very long title. But it says this, uh, God works more frequently in in, in the courts of God than in the tents of Jacob. And what he means to say is that in Israel, every home was like a tent. And God works from home to home, yes. But God especially comes when His people gather together in His courts. That's God's favorite time to work. So our children must feel that. There's expectation. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice in it. Psalter 318, Psalm 118. Let us go to the house of God, children, expecting our covenant God to work in you. As children, we expect it. It's the norm. It's not the abnormal. Sometimes I think when we grew up... We, we were almost conveyed the feeling that it was abnormal for God to work in children. Not so. Ask the children of God in the congregation today. A good percentage of them will tell you God began with them when they were children. Expect the Lord to work. Plead on His promises to work. And let your children feel it. Let you go to church with this attitude. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away His anger that we perish not? David put it this way, Psalm 119, verse 140, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. He loves God's testimonies, he says, exceedingly, more than gold, to the point, David says, where it nearly consumes me, and I would meditate upon it all the day. Well, we all come short of that, don't we? But isn't it a joy that you can set aside worldly obligations for a day and come to God's house and you know that God is going to work there? He's going to save people there. He's going to make people grow in grace there. What a beautiful thing. Convey that to your children. They come with expectation. Well, sadly our time is up. We're going to have to leave it there. But we'll begin next time by actually how to listen to the sermon. How to listen to the sermon. Let's close with a word of prayer. Great God of heaven, we bow before Thee and we ask Thy benediction upon these few thoughts 
about how to come to a sermon in an attitude of listening. O oh Lord, that we may not only learn to listen well to other people and get them to open up to us, to hear what they're saying, to empathize and to sympathize and to counsel and to encourage one another so that iron sharpens iron. But may that kind of listening also happen in the sermon. That we may so listen, we and our children, that it may be as it were a dialogue between thee and us in the sermon. That as thou dost speak to us, that we might be crying out with prayers and supplications to thee. And that we might be unveiling our heart to thee, even under the preaching. Lord, draw us out in the sermons. Thou as heaven's counselor, do thou work mightily in our hearts under the preaching of the word of God. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.